object is kind of stunted. Great. Okay, so we are recording now. Great. Yes. Um, and so um, you see that there's mutually exclusive descriptions which are given to that middle object depending upon what it's compared to. And so this gives you some intuition for why you would say that this process of comparing things that like may belong in the same category can influence how you're going to be describing the objects in the first place. And that's going to be a core process to what we're talking about. Um, okay, our test domain for looking at this is going to be a variant of um, the well-known Bongard problems um, that were developed by an early artificial intelligence researcher, uh, a Russian uh, by the name of Mikhail Bongard. Um, these problems were popularized, at least in my mind, by Doug Hofstadter in his book from 1979, Gerdel Escherbach, where he presented many of these problems as a challenge for AI systems and a good way to think about what uh, human concept learning involves. So the task in a Bangar problem is there's going to be a number of entities, six entities here that belong on the left side, and there'll be six entities that belong on the right side. And your task is to find a rule which will separate the items that belong in the left and the right side. Um, and you, if you put in the chat window, I'll I'll give kudos to whoever gets the answer correctly to begin with. Or if you're in the room with Stephen, you can just shout out perhaps what you think the the rule is. I I wish I could, but I'm I'm having to handle technology at the same time. Exactly. Anybody here who wants to? Uh, so there, yeah. somebody should be able to get it. This, and, uh, this should be this, just this should be an easy one. We have, uh, I guess it's about the size. Oh yeah, that's great. Yeah. Oh, that's a that's a actually uh, Christian has a, a a fancy way of describing this. Um. So it's actually right. So all of the objects on the right side are the same size, and there's uh, a variation in sizes on the left objects. Um. And the reason why I'm saying that's fancy, you could have also said the left side just contains small objects, and the right side does not contain any small objects. But Christian is already thinking more relationally, which is something we're definitely interested in our problems. Okay, so that's one example of a Bongard problem. So you get the idea. Um, this is an open-ended class of problems um, and it could require, and these are very simple problems that I'm giving you here, but they can get arbitrarily uh, sophisticated and, and, and hard to find the answer to. Um, here's another problem I'll give you. Uh, you can just, uh, put in the chat window what you think the right answer is. Size on the right, that was the previous answer, right? Yep, exactly. Great, um, any old triangle? Yes, yeah, so yeah, so there was two answers and uh, I like Erica's uh, amendment to what Hussein said. So on the left side, there is something which is black and it's a triangle. <laughs> and on the right, there's something which is black and it's a circle. Yeah, so that's um, five rights. That's interesting. What, is, what does five rights mean? I don't know. So yeah, so I'll, I'll give Erica points for that one. So th this is something that I would say uh, Mikalski's constructive induction system could have solved because it is just a concatenation of triangular and black for, for, the, for example, the left scenes. Okay, um, here's one that um, Mikalski, Mikalski's system would not be able to solve. Um, and this is fairly challenging for humans. And it's interesting to think as you try to solve it, how you are able to come up with the description. Um, I won't ask you to give a, a full protocol analysis, but it's interesting to see what's going on in your mind while you're coming up with the, the solution to this. Um, this is one of the problems from Mikhail Bangard's uh, original set of problems. Since then, there's uh, been any number of additional problems, uh, 
my colleague and collaborator Doug Hofstadter has created his own set of uh, well, well over a hundred problems. There's an online database of Bongard problems that um, people have contributed to. People like posing them for people and and solving them. Um, so I've been trying to stall for some time to give people a chance to come up with a solution. Um, anybody feel they're close? Oh, very good from Felix. Um, so Felix got exactly the right answer. Um, on the left side, uh, the ends are parallel to each other, um, whereas on the right side, the ends orientations are 90 degrees. So like this and this angle are like 90 degrees if they were to to meet with each other. Um, yeah, so yeah, Felix gets the the point for being the first person to come up with that one, but Hussein is also correct. So this is quite difficult. And what I would maintain is that when Felix was doing this problem, he wasn't originally thinking about these problems in terms of the relative orientation of the two ends. This is a description that he comes up with um, as a process of, of noticing different things in these images where there's a uh, unlimited number of things that could be noticed. Okay, so I would say that this is a game not just played by uh, nerds, although certainly nerds like Bongard problems, but it's also something at the heart of scientific inquiry in general. Um, so uh, John Snow, not during the most recent uh, <laughs> pandemic epidemic we had, but there was also a, a epidemic of cholera in, in Britain, very close to where I am right now, um, back in 1854. And uh, epidemiologist, uh, before they were called epidemiologists, John Snow, uh, discovered a new description that was critically important for figuring out who was going to be contracting cholera, like uh, the proximity to a well and the use of a particular well for providing drinking water uh, in a particular part of London. And so this is quite creative, coming up with that kind of description that wasn't presented to him when people were coming into his office with cholera. Okay, another case of this that's perhaps even more remarkable is James Maxwell, um, also located here in London at King's College, a couple of blocks from where I am now. Um, he is coming up with uh, a kinetic molecular theory of, of ideal gases uh, relating uh, the, the pressure of uh, a volume of gas, the actual volume of it, the temperature, um, the number of molecules in the gas, all of these things can be related to each other by simple mathematical rules under this idea that you are um, um, interpreting what you're seeing in terms of like the pressure gauge in terms of um, bouncing billiard balls, essentially, of invisible teeny tiny billiard balls that are colliding with each other and also colliding with the, the wall. And when they collide with the wall of the containing vessel, then you'll have an uh, increase in pressure. That's what your pressure meter is actually detecting. Okay, so um, this is, uh, a, to me, a remarkable case of creating a new description of these invisible billiard balls um, that was uncannily useful for coming up with uh, categories related to ideal gases. Okay, our variant of these Bongard problems are going to be problems that um, we call physical Bongard problems. And they involve um, imagining that the objects in a scene have normal forces of physics acting on them. They have gravity, they would have collisions, they would have inertia, they would have momentum. So if you were imagining, in this case, it's a two-dimensional physics that was operating on these balls, then that is going to be important for coming up with the answer to this problem, um, which I will pose for you. Um, anybody have an answer to the left side versus the right side scenes?
And here I'll give you the hint that it, it could require postulating uh, a two-dimensional physics. Anybody? Anybody have any answers that are close but not correct? <laughs> Okay, well, I'll give you the answer in this case, then. There is a, okay, go ahead. On the left. Oh, yeah. There's a, a question and answer from the audience. Go ahead, yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, on the left, the objects are together after the move, and on the right, they are apart. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. That, so that's a, exactly right. So after you imagine these forces of physics on the objects on the left, uh, the objects would be together. <laughs> they would be, end up touching, whereas on the right side, they, they do not end up touching. They would be uh, all apart from each other. So a small little difference here means that this ball is going to roll in this way. It's not going to roll on top. Um, in other cases, um, like this... <laughs> rectangle is just going to stay where it is. It's not going to fall on top of the, the other object. Okay, so that it gives you a good example of a, a fairly simple uh, physical bond guard problem. Okay, so um, maybe I'll give the demonstration of our system before I unpack it. So we have a system which solves these bond guard problems, and we're trying to have it solve the problems in a human-like way. So we're not trying to do, um, you know, a standard deep learning project of just uh, having it solve the Bangar problems as good as it can. We're trying to have it solve them in a way that would be reminiscent of, of a person. And so you can access uh, these problems yourself. So you can do them yourselves for the people zooming in. Uh, I'm just putting in the, the link in the chat window. So this is an example of a Bangar problem on the left side here. Um, and you can run the physics and the the system that we're going to be talking about which is our system is called paths actually has a, a simple physics engine underlying it which it can run in order to derive new descriptions that it hadn't derived before and so um that's so what I'm showing you here is part of what okay. paths would be using and if I say run, then we'll see that it is uh, running the simulations, it'll run the physics engine, and it will also eventually come up with uh, a solution potentially. And the solution that it eventually comes up with here is only on the left side scenes, does there exist um, only one object, basically objects that are one in number. Well, you, so plug this, in, you, you plug in. Yeah, excuse me? Or did you mean that for me? I don't know who that was. Okay. Um, so you, Stephen, have the ability to mute people if you figure out who it is. <laughs> and they probably want to be muted. Um, okay. So um, so in this case, um, if we could rerun the program, it might not be guaranteed to find exactly the same solution. Oh, in this case, it decided to focus on the right scenes and says... There are objects that are two. Other things to notice here is you have this running list of hypotheses that it's considering. And for each of the hypotheses, it'll tell you which objects and which scenes are supported and not supported by a particular hypothesis. Um, and down here, we have features that it's noticing. This is not the complete set of features, but this is some of the features that it's noticing, including relational features like on top of, far from, above, uh, uh, supports. These are all um, features that there is a pre-wired machinery in order to, to detect. So um, anything else I want to point out about 
these um what one other thing that you might notice is it's you can see that it's comparing the scenes in these pairs and here we've got it set up so it's comparing uh scenes that belong in different categories um and this is something that's useful for us in modeling empirical results where we um either temporally or spatially present some scenes that are close to each other. Um, and we are interested in how that influences how long it takes people to come up with the answer. Um, okay, so this uh, is- A uh, quick question, uh, Ram, quick, it's Steve Hansen. Yeah. Yeah, uh, now, uh, how do, where do the features come from again? How are they constructed or are they simply defined prior to you running the simulations? So each of the features that are in this panel here, there is a code snippet that calculates them. Um, right. So for but, example- but, but you came up with these features ahead of time. These, yeah. And so, okay. yeah, I, so, so there is a big question about um, coming, what it means in paths to come up with new featural descriptions. Um, yeah, so so <laughs> I'd like to think it does come up with new featural descriptions, but the features that you see in this panel are pre-givens, okay? So these are things that it's built in to detect can move up, for example. To, uh, to apply can move up, it looks to see whether, so to speak, if there was a thin string which was um, attached to an object, and that uh, and that string was lifted up, would that string uh, remain uh, unbroken? And it would remain unbroken if it can if it can move up. That's that's example of how these things would be computed. Um, okay, let me try to give a slightly harder problem. Um, here's one that you can uh, do a, a John Henry test to see if you can solve it faster than than paths does so this this is a a, a diff, more difficult problem but in this case uh paths is coming up with the idea that only in the left scenes are there for all objects that's a universal quantifier here objects that are next to beside with a particular threshold for what it means to be beside uh any object at the end so what it's saying basically is that if we ran this simulation, this weird polygon is going to be beside this uh, landmark object, this uh, uh, quadrilateral object. Okay, and that's not true for uh, the objects on, on the right side, for example. Uh, this object, it's not beside this polygon, it's, it's on top of the polygon. Okay, so... Um, one of the reasons for using these physical bond guard problems is to make it extremely clear that you have to do something, a costly computation, in order to come up with uh, a new description that wasn't there before. So you can't figure out whether you end up with something besides something else until you engage in this process of running the simulation. Okay, right. So that's... So that's um, that's what the end result is going to look like. And I'm not going to be able to describe the entire simulation. Um, it, it's quite complicated, uh, the, everything that's going on here. Um, and it, it, what we're doing looks pretty different from standard mathematical models in category learning. Because um, we have, for example, to in answering Steve, Stephen's question, um, uh, Stephen Hansen, uh, we have a lot of um, different detectors. We have a lot of different uh, pieces of machinery for detecting different types of relation and different types of attribute. Um, and many of these have multiple parameters themselves. So we're not going to be engaged in the mathematical psychology game of trying to find the optimal fitting parameters 
for these different detections of relations. Um, there'd be, you know, this would be hugely over-parameterized. Um, and my only justification for this is that what we're doing is actually quite a lot more complicated than is um, standard for computational models and category learning. So standard models and category learning can't create these new descriptions that we're creating. So, and we think that this is an important part of category learning. So that's why our model is going to be looking fairly different. Um, so so, so at, Rob, would you say it's not doing it the way we do it? Or are you saying, um, yeah, that's my question. No, no, I think it's 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 solving these Bangar problems like a human, or that's what we're trying for. The goal is to make it human-like. Um, I, what I meant was it's not solving category learning problems in a way that standard models of category learning hypothesize, you know, things like GCM or Alcove or Sustain. It's it's quite different in in what it, it looks like and the, the kinds of preoccupations that it has. And chief among I, those. I, I yeah. guess I guess my question then is uh this is one where you can't exactly imagine how the brain would do it or a neural network. So um yeah so um so I, I'm some form of functionalist, I think. So what I would be maintaining is that when you saw this running list of hypotheses that it was considering, those would be roughly comparable to things that people might notice in the, the two scenes of a, of a Bangar problem. So that's the kind of level of which we think this is a psychologically plausible uh, explanation of, of what people are doing in order to come up with these new descriptions. Okay, that... I'll buy that. Okay, um, so of critical importance for paths then um, is that it develops these context-dependent descriptions, um, and the kinds of context dependency. There's there's three that I wanted to point out that I think are are particularly important. Um, and one is that we have like context dependent shifts in the threshold for calling an object big or close or above or right of. Um, so there's not, these are fuzzy uh, categories, fuzzy descriptions and relations. Um, and we actually use uh, a fuzzy logic that was developed by uh, AI researcher uh, Irene Block, and we modify it. Um, so in in Block's scheme for like figuring out what are all of the objects that are left of um, this red object, so that there's this red object in the middle, and I want to say what are all of the uh, points in space that would be left of uh, that uh, red horizontal line. And hers is a fuzzy logic, so it it will um, uh, break off gradually, um, where the object, the positions here are going to be very good examples of left of, and then it drops off, it tapers off as you go up higher and lower. Um, and these, this is the region for right of, um, and what we are doing in modifying block for this spatial relation of left of and right of, um, we actually do the subtraction of left from right. Because, well, from our perspective, if you if you see the stock that I'm just adding there, uh, that would be a pretty good um, member of right for block and actually left for block. And so we find more psychologically plausible relations if we subtract one for the other. So, um, so our representation of right of is going to be the activation map that you get from right minus the activation map that you get from left. And so that's because we don't want A over here to be considered to be uh, right of or left of for that matter are, it's really on top of. And so you get that by doing this contrastive coding. Uh, as another example, um, this A 
which is inside this U shape. Um, in the original encoding from Block, uh, that would be considered a pretty good example of left and a pretty good example of right because uh, there's a lot of pixels of the U that this shape in the middle would be right of and left of. But you get a, a better idea of what right is by saying, take the right map minus the left map. And that gives you this map, which is more plausible. Now, where this would fit in is, um, like in this Bongard, I'll just give you the answer here. Uh, in this Bongard problem, um, you could give a description like a triangle is above the rectangle on the left side and triangle is beside or right of the rectangle on the right side. Um, and there's people come up with this quite reliably. And interestingly, they come up with that same description of a rule. If we, did you see what I did there? <laughs> if I moved uh, one of the scenes from the left side to the right side, uh, this used to be described as the triangle being above the rectangle. And now it's being used to describe, it, the description is uh, the triangle is right of the, the rectangle. And on different Bongard problems, uh, paths can give both of those descriptions because of this fuzzy logic. And so that's an example of one kind of context dependency. The, maybe the, the bigger context dependency, which is used all the time in paths, is that descriptions that are frequently given for scenes in one category will tend to be tested for other scenes from that same category. So once you begin to notice something like, hmm, those lines seem to be parallel to each other at the beginning and the end, it will tend to use that description. It'll notice that for other scenes in the same category. And in that way, you can end up with descriptions that would be very unlikely to be applied to a complex scene with lots of objects, and it will still come up with that description. Okay, the final kind of context sensitivity that we've been empirically very interested in is the sort of the immediate temporal and spatial context. Um, and uh, going along with um, some psychological evidence, there's two things at work here. Um, you will tend to pay attention to similar descriptions. Um, if two adjacent scenes come from the same category, and here I mean adjacent either in a temporal sequence or adjacent spatially, uh, depending on how you lay out the, the displays. Um, and the other half of this is you tend to attend to dissimilarities between two scenes if those two scenes that are close to each other in time or space come from different categories. Okay, and we'll see where that comes in later on. So um, this is the high level architecture of paths. Um, it's a stochastic algorithm and it does basically three kinds of action. It can perceive features of target scenes or target objects within a scene. Um, it'll stochastically select a target and a feature and test it. And it can also run this physics engine in order to drive new things from like the trajectory or the endpoint of, of the, the simulation. And this is what's going to give rise to creating new hypotheses, new descriptions, descriptions that it could test on other scenes. Um, the other kind of action that it could do is check a hypothesis stochastically select one of the hypotheses from its running queue of hypotheses, and then try it out on the current scene pair that it's looking at. And the final thing that it could do is recombine hypotheses, stochastically select two hypotheses. Uh, you can combine features together with ands or ors, or you could adjust a relation, maybe Closeness is relevant, but you had too demanding an idea of what closeness required. Okay. And so here you have a, a recursive first order predicate logic for creating new descriptions. If you've created something like um, stable objects at end, then that becomes a description which could be inserted in uh, a more elaborate description later on. Okay.
Um, so um, let me try try to skip that part. Um, these are some of the things that Paths notices. Um, so uh, there's different types of spatial relations that it is built in to notice, um, different types of movement. Uh, one of the things that's super important in it is this idea of building up groups. So you can build up a group of objects within a scene, and the group of objects could be based upon like a spatial group. I'm going to make uh, a group for all of these objects because they're all in the same part of a scene, for example. Um, it could be based upon the role, that they're all occupying the same role in a relation. Um, and it could also be something like uh, their, um, uh, a similarity group. I'm going to group all of these objects together because they're all squares or because they're all small. Okay, so this idea of building up groups becomes very important for um, I don't know, flexible reinterpretation of a scene that has a lot of objects in it. Um, okay, so uh, we're willing to, to some degree, play this game of, of, of doing correlations, not fitting any particular uh, uh, free parameters in this model, uh, but there are, um, I guess, uh, tweakings of this model that we've done in the past, certainly, um, to try to make it more human-like. Um, and here's a rough correlation between the the difficulty of different physical bond guard problems that we've created uh the human difficulty on the vertical axis and the uh, the model difficulty on the horizontal axis um very roughly speaking you would say it's doing an okay job of of explaining why something is difficult for a person maybe not spectacularly good. And it does a particularly bad job at this problem 31. Uh, this problem is very hard. It's gettable by paths, but it's way, way easier for humans. If you're curious what the problem is, um, this is this problem where I guess humans would say on the left side, the circle is free to escape, whereas on the right side, uh, the circle can't get out. Um, so we have this feature of uh, can move up. Uh, if we cheated and we made this uh, feature more salient to the system, then it would be able to solve this problem. But the problem is that most of our problems don't involve have, uh, can move in, can move up. And so uh, there's trade-offs. So, uh, yeah, so that's that's why the system isn't able to come up with a solution very quickly, because this is a kind of uh, feature that's not very relevant for for many of the, the physical Bongar problems that we test. Um, so uh, you can also just look at solution times, and the correlation is pretty decent. Um, I won't oversell the the degree of correlation. Um, we're more interested in like functional. Uh, similarities between how paths works and how humans work. Um, and just to give, uh, yeah, I think I'll be finishing up here. So there's time for questions. Um, we got a little bit of a late start, but um, in this is one kind of a uh, good example of what we do with human experiments. Um, we look to see how easy it is to solve problems as a function of what kinds of problems are next to each other. So what is the answer to this problem? Um, this is a hard problem, actually. Um, the, on the left side, um, I would say that we have like ambiguous movement, whereas on the right side, we have unambiguous movement. And that's the same solution for all four of these bond guard problems. The only thing that we're changing going across these four problems is uh, how are we laying out on the screen the four different uh, or the different scenes that belong in a problem. And so, um, for example, here you have this scene and it looks pretty similar to this 
other scene that belongs in the other category. Whereas if we go down here, these two scenes that are occupying analogous locations within their sides, uh, they look pretty different from each other. Okay, so the empirical result for both the model and for humans is the easiest kind of problem is one in which um, you have within scenes that are close to each other being dissimilar to each other, and you have between categories, you have scenes that are similar to each other. Okay, just to spell that out, this is uh, the easiest problem because you have these two scenes that are in aligned locations that are similar to each other, belonging to different categories. These two scenes are aligned and they belong to different categories. Um, and you have these two scenes that belong in the same category and they're dissimilar to each other, just like these two scenes belong to the same category and they're dissimilar to each other. Um, so what to our mind is going on is that it's good to pair similar scenes that belong to different categories because it immediately narrows down the space of hypotheses, of descriptions that you're going to be testing. So you know that it doesn't have anything to do with like having two triangles because both of the scenes have two triangles and two circles and they have the two circles in the middle. So you immediately know um, uh, from a narrow set, what are the, the more critical components when you have two things that belong into different categories that are overall similar to each other? And likewise, having dissimilarities within a category side, uh, that helps you because it uh, stops you from false alarming. <laughs> so like if I had compared this object next to this object, then you might say, oh, I know what it is. The left side all has one object. You're not inclined to false alarm in that way. So the easiest condition combines uh, dissimilar scenes within category and similar scenes between categories. And the hardest condition by that same kind of logic is one in which you have dissimilarity across categories and you have similarity within categories. Um, and just to uh, hammer this home, um, this is true for both humans on the left side and paths on the right side. Um, of these effects between category similarities seems to be more influential for our particular Bangar problems than within category similarity. But between category similarity is, is uh, helping you and uh, within category similarity is hurting you. Uh, uh, difficulty is uh, what we're plotting. So uh, difficulty as it goes up, it's, it's more difficult. Okay, so um, there's more I could talk about, um, but, <laughs> and to, and to really, uh, um, give a description of paths, I think it helps to play around with it yourself a bit. Um, but maybe I've given enough of a high level description so you kind of get what we're, we're after. So our core commitments throughout all of this, uh, the big idea is that we believe that these descriptions of scenes must be continually created while uh, you're working on the concept rules. So you're creating these concept rules at the same time that uh, the descriptions are being made. Um, we talked about three different ways in which context is influencing the descriptions that you're giving. Um, and for us, these new descriptions are coming from perceptions, from these physical simulations that you're running. Um, and they're not just sort of trivially coming out from recombinations uh, of Boolean concatenators. Um, and in that way, I think we're um, wanting to contrast what we're doing from classic work in constructive induction. I would link our work um, more to uh, Shimon Allman, um, 
I was mentioning Tomer Ullman, his son's work on uh, how people might internally create simulations. But the elder uh, Ullman was very interested in talking about the visual routines that people use for doing things like detecting spatial relations. Uh, we're interested in reading off from our physical simulations, things like support and stability. Um, and in this same context, one of the things that's important for us is the idea of creating different perceptual groups of items within a scene. Uh, at the same time, um, unlike deep learning systems, uh, we're interested in explicitly creating rules that are composed from a recursive grammar. Um, and so you probably, uh, you may have seen some of the hypotheses had embedded parentheses, wherever you see an embedded parentheses in the hypothesis, then you have uh, this recursive grammar of, of descriptions once they're created being used in other descriptions. Um, and so concept formation then is an open-ended search for these compositions of descriptions that don't just start there, but they're, they're continually being created. Um, and we also believe in open, reproducible, testable code. So um, in the chat window, I put uh, a link to the system so that you can try it yourself. You can uh, try to stump uh, paths. Um, I'll give you a, a bit of a spoiler. It's it's all too easy to, to stump paths. So you'll be able to create uh, your own scenes that um, paths won't be able to solve, that you will think that it should be able to solve. Um, I'm with you. So I see paths as very much a work in progress. Um, uh, the input to paths, so when you're, you can drag in your own uh, displays into paths, uh, the input that it takes is SVG. And we can talk more about that. So it's theoretically important that it's taking SVG files. Uh, SVG stands for uh, Scalable Vector Graphics. Um, and by using SVG files, we are um, punting on some uh, more basic computer graphics, computer vision routines for um, figure ground segmentation. So SVG files already come packaged with figures, like polygons are described that have colors to them and particular locations. So um, yeah, maybe we can talk about that in, in Q&A if people want. Okay, so that's my pitch. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and open up for questions. That was terrific, uh, Rob, as always. Thank you very much. It's really food for thought. Um, I'll just play my usual role of icebreaker until people start to asking their own questions. Uh, can you just for... It's not a challenge. It's just an information question. What is the difference between a feature and a description? So, uh, so this is just um, um, our technical jargon, but the the features for us are going to be the things at the bottom of the simulation, and and those things like include like can move up and above and to. Um, and the, the descriptions then are going to be built out of those features. Okay, so like a, a, a descriptor that you could be applying to interrogate a particular scene could be something like uh, uh, object at the end, which is uh, above a stable object. And that, that would be a description. Okay, Christian has a question, Christian Levier, and I'll pass to him right away. Just in passing, I want to say you said that this was different from Boolean approaches. But don't you think yeah. this could be subsumed by a Boolean approach? I mean, Boolean, that's, that leaves you a lot of degrees of freedom on what you call a, an element. Um, so, so what feels different to, to me is that these descriptions um, involve like running the simulation and it, it's just 
completely computationally exploding to think about creating all of these ahead of time. So like the, the feel that you get for many rule-based AI systems is you, you start with all of the, the features and then you'll recombine them to, to create your Boolean expressions. Whereas for us, um, well, in addition to being like a first order predicate logic rather than just the, the Boolean description, um, it's, it's super important for pragmatic reasons that you're not starting off with all of these descriptions. It's not like you have this stable of the these features that you've already read off of the the scenes it's like you're you're building up you're noticing different things about the scenes while while it's unfolding and i think there's it's it's there'd be too many problems if you're, you're on if, the fly they're on the fly and that's essential for you that they're on the fly so not yeah. Okay, got it. Uh, Christian, who, was, who, who has already spoken in this series, but yeah. he spoke in this series, but before this became the theme. So I'll be interested to hear what Christian's query is. Go ahead. Merci. Uh, so I came a little late, so sorry if I missed that, if you mentioned that in your uh, introduction, but that, that extraction of relations, they thought to be more broadly central to intelligence. So have you thought of applying this to classic tests like Raven's progressive matrices? Yeah. So um, some of the architecture could certainly apply to Ravens. And I think so Ravens to me has very much the same flavor of there's too many things to read off of a, a particular scene within Ravens. So and, and particular relations between the elements across the different um, uh matrix elements within a Ravens problem. So um, to me, that part of our model would be very applicable. Um, the, the, you know, the explicit task of a Ravens problem is different from our task. So ours is, you know, certainly a, a categorization task um, where, and in the Ravens task, um, you know, you're, you're trying to fill out what would be the, the missing element. So at that level, I think you're going to have a, a slightly different um, algorithm that, that's needed to piece together the descriptions you've noticed. But I would like to think that exactly the same on look, what as Stephen was saying, on the fly description creation would be definitely a component for both kinds of tasks. And they also seem, um, the, the ARC task that Cholet has talked extensively about recently. Um, what is that abstract reasoning corpus? That also, that would also involve uh, this sort of uh, uh, creation of descriptions um, that that is continual and also context dependent, critically. If I may have a quick follow up. So, so I... Yeah. Uh, well, as, as someone who's tried to model Ravens, for example, uh, I, I don't know that the sort of the application part, so fill in the sort of the blank, is, is that much of a difference. I think the main difference between your task of concept formation, and, the, and especially the Bongard problem and Ravens, is that in the Bongard problem, you have two sets and you have to find sort of ru a rule mm -hmm. that distinguishes between the two sets, whereas in Ravens, you have potentially multiple lines and you have to find a common relation between those lines. I don't know if that makes a fundamental difference for the search process, but to, to me, that, that, that yeah. that's the key there. But I don't know that it's that, that fundamental. Yeah. So, so I, th I think essentially I'm agreeing with you. I think that there's something in the, the ARC task and Ravens and this that, um, I would say is description building during the during the comparison process, um, and so um, in our system, the output in in some ways the output is just this this rule. It's this expression written in this uh, first order predicate grammar for for what distinguishes the left side from the right side, um, and I think if you are cleverly designing your your ravens problems it would also be the case that the the subject to solving a ravens problem could state what that rule is 
So I so I think that the, it's a commonality between them as well, probably. Um, now, of course, there's a lot of deep learning solutions that try to punt on that rule creation part, right? And they try to just fill in, and that's what I that's what I think is is unlikely to be fruitful in the long run. So I don't believe that you'll be able to solve ARC tasks or Melanie Mitchell's copycat problems or our Bongard problems without being able to do some of this explicit verbalization about what is the basis for the, the answer you're giving. Okay, thank you. Gary uh, Lupian, who's also been in this series, has the next question. He will be in the yeah. series. I'm yeah. sorry, he's um, in this series, he will be. Hey, Rob. Um, I also jo uh, joined a bit late, but um, we've actually used some of these. It was uh, fun to see them again. Um, some years back, we used some of these physical bond guard problems and also regular bond guard problems to look at the role of nameability. So there's kind of, it, it was raised earlier, you know, where do these features come from? And for people, uh, they come pre-equipped with a bunch <clears throat> of features, uh, largely through language for physical problems, also from their uh, you know, experience in the world. Um, and if you build problems, uh, we found that kind of try to maintain the same logic or the same relation, but make it harder to name, uh, people have a harder time, yeah. right? And so I'm wondering how you think about the role of language um, either in the course of kind of building descriptions from these primitives, right? Language makes it easy to to combine and recombine things like, oh, is it this and this, right? Let's try that hypothesis. But also as a source of these maybe kind of core features that that are especially useful in solving these problems or more or or more complex yeah. features. I don't know. Yeah. So I, I think language, uh, like you would argue, I think language is going to be a super big part of this. And also maybe the, the distinction that Coslin made years ago between metric and non-metric uh, elements. And I, I have a feeling that it's far easier for people to solve these problems when they're metric rather than non-metric. There's something categorical. And that's partially given the, the nature of our task is coming up with rules, right? And and so that's sort of uh, built into our system. And and you could argue, why why are we interested in these these rule-based categories when so many of our categories don't seem to have rules underlying them. And, uh, and I guess I would argue that um, uh, maybe we don't know how many of our categories actually have a more rule-like flavor to them. Um, it's certainly fitting in with the modern mission towards explainable AI. Right. So part of explainable AI is we want to know why that our AI system is giving the performance it is giving. And, and so the kind of rules that are the output to paths are, are super useful for that. And also there's something to the idea that um, oftentimes you don't want just to use overall resemblance in an analog kind of way, but you want to be able to push around the system. You want to say, well, you know, I'm really interested in um the countries that have at least 20 million people in, in them and are located south of the equator, right? And so people oftentimes when they're interacting with these systems, they'll they'll want to express uh, their constraints in terms of rules. So th that's our justification for doing this. Maybe what some people would say seems like a kind of artificial, uh, overly explicit task. Um, so, so yes, language is critically important for our enterprise, obviously. Um, um, what is of interest to me and you, I think, is, is the, um, uh, the interface between the language and the perceptual skills. So I'm still very interested in um, taking seriously what are the, the visual routines that would be used for figuring out whether an object is above or supporting another object. Um, and those are not exactly the same, right? right. As uh, the people in uh, building 
cognitive grammars have been pointing out for years now. So um, I'm interested in like how we have to support these nuanced language distinctions that we're making. So um, how can we think about building the, the next generation of paths, code snippets, so that it would be able to reason about like something being above or supporting or on top of another object and all those might be different. So to me, the challenge is how can we create these, these perceptual routines to to support the language and, and the other way around. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. We have, uh, we, have a, we have several other questions, but I'll use my prerogative to make an intervention here. You must have thought, uh, um, Rob, about the relation between the kinds of things that come out of the on-fly, on-the-fly categories and the notion of prepositions. Now, in, in a language, there are two kinds of words, open class and closed class. The closed class are clearly names of categories. Excuse me, the open class are clearly names of categories, category names. The closed class, uh, that is function words, are not. And the interesting thing about prepositions is that they sort of straddle them. They're like on the fly function words. Has that entered into your thinking at all? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I have been influenced by... Um, like Melissa Bowerman's work um, showing that uh, we don't necessarily, we don't want to have a system that um, comes uh, pre-wired with a, a singular notion of support or on top of, right? Because uh, different languages carve things up differently in terms of what support means, um, you know, like how loose that support could be, like how tight versus loose it is and how, and what is the exact spatial relation as well. Um, so um, I I think what I would like to be thinking about is, is how you would be flexibly creating uh, new feature descriptions out of what kind of subcomponents. And this goes back to something that like uh, Stephen was, uh, Stephen Hansen was asking during my talk is, well, you know, you've got these pre-coded bank of features and there has to be something underneath them, some other elements and uh, maybe elements is the wrong term for me, some sort of procedures. There's got to be some kinds of visual spatial procedures that can be cobbled together so as to, to create your above. And that would give our system quite a lot more flexibility than it, than it currently has. So, um, uh, so I don't know whether I answered your question, Stephen. Um, or, 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 we'll talk about it again. There's, there's lots of other people who want to, want to intervene. Also, I want to ask the people who are present here, if you have questions, just raise your hands for me because they won't appear on the, on the screen. Alizi, Alizi Vazi. Thank you. Uh, regarding the path uh, computational model, I would like to know how does the path uh, computational model differ and its approach to learning and categorizing new scene descriptions compared to human performance, particularly in the control of physical bungard problems. Also, yeah. I'd like to know, could you elaborate on the specific strengths and limitations of path and predicting spatial dynamics of scenes? Yeah, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so, um, yeah, and I, don't yeah i don't want to oversell the resemblance between paths and humans it's it's not uncannily good um i you know but you know in some ways i feel like in in my world of category learning it's doing something pretty remarkably different from all of the models of category learning that are you know proper working computational models that i know of um, and so I think it deserves credit for that. But when I look at the hypotheses that Paths produces, um, it they don't. A lot of them don't seem like the kinds that that people would be creating. Um, I mean, it's a little bit hard to tell because many of these would be um, whatever unconscious, or there there too many of these are being thought of per 
second. So people's intuitions might not be great, but I, I would say a problem with paths is that it'll um, sort of loop back around and it will consider the same hypothesis when a, a person would say, oh yeah, I already went down that and it's um, a dead end. And this is also something that uh, that um, Doug Hofstadter students over the years have had to face. Um, so that was a problem with copycat from Melanie Mitchell and she and some of the successors to copycat, uh, like um, uh, uh, Marshall for his dissertation, he probably tried to put in metacognitive ability so that it wouldn't get stuck in these, these dead ends. Um, so that's a limitation of paths. Um, to me, the big one is coming up with um, a broader set of descriptions. So like that problem that I posed you with the, the line segments, PATH does not actually solve that problem because um, it's starting with these SVG files rather than bitmap representations. So it won't surprise you that I, I'm always interested in um, having more you know, qualitatively different emergent descriptions coming out of it. And by starting with objects that are already pre-articulated, um, I'm eliminating the ability to come up with some interesting emergent descriptions like the kind that would be required for that distinction. Okay, thank you very much. And now Steve. Thanks. I think Mario is first, but no, uh, actually in the in the queue he was after you. No okay, problem. that's okay. That's great. Hi. So, uh, yeah, this talk does give me a little bit of a historical kind of um um we. I feel like I'm in the '90s. Okay, so there's a sense in which. So uh, I had developed a model that was in contrast to uh, Mikowski's back in this time period. And of course, his AQ model was, a, was an attempt uh, to create something that would generate actual explicit rules for expert systems. Because ex expert systems, a problem, of course, everyone found with expert systems, well, how do you make all these rules up? And you, you, you know, if we want to do something with a cardio system, I mean, we need to get uh, cardiologist in here and then define QRS and then this gets way too complicated. So this was, a, now the problem was, is that all failed for other reasons and I won't go into it and I'm not suggesting you're on the same uh, direction here, but there's an implicit explicit dichotomy that you have sort of forced upon us at this level and I have to say it's true and I have made this argument to Hinton and uh, Jan Lecun and others saying, look, these deep learning systems, uh, and I think Benjo actually gets this, these deep learning systems are not explicit. They do not produce anything that looks explicit. They're, they're in the implicit you know, side of the brain. They're, they're, they're in the striatum. They're not going to produce language. Now, I was saying that before chatbots appeared, so just to be fair, <laughs> and then when they appeared, I, I did have to do some reconciliation here. But it does occur to me, let's take an example like, um, in chemistry and, and uh, certainly physics, Einstein was full of these things, but uh, Kekuli, who had discovered the benzene ring, he spent a year on this and he woke up one night in a nightmare and he saw monkeys with their tails hanging from each other and then reaching up and, and they created this ring. And then he went immediately wrote down the benzene ring. Now, of course, uh, he never really talked about the monkeys much, but clearly this was the problem-solving aspect that made it work. In other words, all the digestive stuff you see in these implicit learning systems like deep learning are not initially available. And I'm not saying they won't be available, but they do in fact create huge opportunities for discovery. I mean, look at protein folding, look at you know, there's been a thousand new materials that have been discovered that no one even knew existed on Earth. This is insane. Something's happened that's way, that just blew away all of the history of uh, category learning in terms of specific machine learning models. I just don't think we can go back. So I'm going to leave it there and let you. <laughs> I'm, oh, okay. a question. I'm just, I'm just 
I'm just generally so, criticizing everybody. Yeah. Um. Okay. Um. So I'm not opposed to neural networks. Uh, and in general, I find deep learning. No, and I didn't say you were. I didn't say you were. So I find deep learning extremely exciting, and I think it's going to be super useful for coming up with emergent descriptions. What what I find naive is the idea that if you use a convolutional net, network um, or even um, a transformer model architecture, that you will be able to solve our physical bond guard problems um, because they aren't creating this underlying simulation. So we create these problems so that the only way to know whether you have like stable versus unstable or whether the objects will end up touching or not touching is if you actually conduct the, the proper simulation. And so I don't think that these systems will solve these problems unless they take seriously the the need to to have the the architecture that can actually generate these simulations. Now, um, how much of that for humans is hardwired versus learned? I'll, I, I'm agnostic on that. But somehow, but I, I think we know that the transformer networks don't solve these. We we've tried to do the same. Um, tests that like um, uh, Webb and Holyoke and Melanie Mitchell has also been involved in this discourse um, that they've um, said, well, you know, you can actually solve um, the copycat string problems that Melanie posed if you first convert them into uh, uh, an English-like description and then apply the transformer model on and they get some good results melanie mitchell has questioned whether these were actually out of training set problems or whether they, there was already enough copycat letter problems in the archives that were that um that were trained on so that it would be able to actually solve some of these and when you give new problems it doesn't seem to be able to do very well and it's in that latter spirit that uh, that I'm saying that we're we're trying to come up with these physical bond guard problems um, exactly to show that it would be implausible to think that they'll come up with these solutions without being able to um, get uh, a physics. And then the yeah, question yeah, is, what yeah, kind of no, algorithms I, will create them? I agree with you. I, but the, it's a bit of a counterfactual because, you know, there's probably some graduate student somewhere in Montreal right now figuring out how to do bond guard problems with a recurrent neural network. So let's just wait for that to happen. But I think if we go back yeah. in time to the Mikowski thing, I had developed a, a, a model that uh, appeared in machine learning, and it was uh, basically based on family resemblance, and there, I called it Wittgensteinian things. But the key thing there, in that problem, there's a very old problem called polymorphy. And it's very much like the Bongard problem. In fact, it might be the, the, the typical prototypical example for the Bongard. And I'd be curious if your system could actually deal with polymorphy. The, the examples uh, turn out when people do this, you know, basically laying a card down and making a prediction, doing a survey, they never get a description. However, at the end of this, if you show them an example of the polymorphic category, they'll say, oh, yeah, that's A. But they can't they can't tell you why it is. Partly it's the complexity, <laughs> partly it's the fact that it's probabilistic. Okay, so it's it's a it's a complex probabilistic category. So you can learn to recognize it. And of course, pigeons do this <laughs> test very well. Humans do it pretty well, but they can't describe what's going on. And I'm I'm curious because it's basically exactly the same problem. I'll mail it to you if you're interested. Just drop me yeah. a line. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's, in, it's in the original machine learning paper. Uh, yeah. uh, so the way paths works is it it is coming up with rules. So if there were categories that were built around family resemblance and prototypes, um, yeah. it it would be spinning its wheels forever because it's not going to be satisfied until right. the description applies to all of the scenes on the left no, side it, and none of the scenes on the well, right it side. Does. It does. Yeah. You can come up with a description, but the description involves not uh, DNF, but some kind of uh, probabilistic structure. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Like, and, like, right. like M out of N. That polymorphy is exactly M out of N, like a threshold logic. 
That's why yes. it's tricky. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that would. So we do not create those kinds of rules. <laughs> so that so we we create like um, uh, existential and universal quantifiers and and exists one. So in order to account for some human like rule creation, we we have a, a, a third quantifier, which is sort of it, only one exists. It um exactly one. Uh, but I think, yeah. So if we were to create descriptions like two out of three or n out of m, then then maybe we would be able to handle those problems. But it sounds like we won't be able to. Yeah, as it is. That's, yeah, that's, that's interesting. We were uh, through no fault of yours, we're almost out of time. And so we only have time for Mario's short question. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Very interesting talk. Uh, please, can you uh, tell us a little about the temporal aspect of your solution? Uh, how is it implemented? Like you do transformations of uh, the 2D scene. Uh, if you can tell us a little bit about the temporal aspect. If you build time series, do some transformations. Um, so there's two aspects of temporality. One is the, the temporality of considering the different scenes. And the other is the, the within scene temporality. Yeah, I'm interested with the, in the second one. Okay, so, so we use an off the shelf physics engine for doing the simulations. Um, it's called Box2D and there's other existing simulators that could be used. Um, and we're not making any strong commitment to humans, you know, having uh, a veridical, truthful, like uh, simulator that they have access to. Um, you know, I'm happy with what Mike McCloskey's work from the 70s showing that there's um, biases in our simulations, that there there's cases in which they're systematically off. And, and I think that's right. But uh, I guess for simplicity purposes, we're allowing all of the, the temporal unfolding of the simulation just to be uh, handled for us by Box2D. So we're reading off of Box2D physics simulation, and we're treating it somewhat like a, a black box. So if we were more sophisticated cognitive scientists, we'd probably be using a version of Box2D that was, um, I don't know, warped or influenced by the particular biases that uh, folk like Michael McCloskey have pointed out. Um, so, so yeah, that is, so the, the temporality in that sense, we're sort of um, farming out, <laughs> I guess. Okay. Cool. Very good, thank you so much. <laughs> Steve, was that a follow-up that you had in the last seconds? Or did you just forget to remove your hand? Steve Hansen? Okay, it looks like he, he forgot to remove his hand. Okay, I want to thank you again, Rob. Many apologies for, for my technical incompetence that delayed the beginning. It was wonderful. It filled the time very well anyway. And, and it's not the last time you'll be here. Thanks. It was a pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Marika, tu peux. Ah, c'est moi. C'est moi qui I'm the one who wants to put an end to the recording.